Welcome everyone back for another episode of Woven Wings Live, where we bring you wisdom and tools for vibrant living. I'm Gabe Crane. I'm joined as always by my co-host Rahul Deedwania. And if you enjoy listening to us, please share our work with a friend or leave us a review where you listen to podcasts and join our newsletter, which is linked in the show description to follow along the journey. Today's episode is titled Building Multi-Faith Coalitions for Civic Change. Our guest is Sharik Abdul Ghani of the Minaret Foundation. And we are really excited and lucky to have Sharik with us here today. Uh, the Minaret Foundation, which we'll be learning about, is a really awesome example, I think, of this weaving in action theme that we've done in other episodes. Um, just awesome, on the ground, real work that's happening in the world of interfaith peace building and relationship building. And so before we get into that, um, I guess I just want to bring you in, Rahul. What's uh, moving you today in relationship to this topic? And yeah, what are you thinking about as we come in for this episode today? Yeah, thank you, Gabe, as always. And, uh, you know, this is a topic that uh, I find to be very personally interesting. You know, I think the narrative um, around different faiths is is often divisive. Um, and even more broadly, I think narratives around society uh, these days and, you know, along a lot of vectors tends to feel at least feel divisive, right? There are a lot of labels and definitions, uh, whether it's political, you know, left versus right, whether it's geographical, um, coastal versus uh, inland versus southern versus northeast, right? Um, and certainly faith-based, right? And, and even growing up, um, I think about uh, the community that I grew up in, right, which was a predominantly Hindu community. And on the one hand, there is this, uh, this understanding, at least in the version of Hinduism that I grew up around that like, Hey, there are many different versions of God and different ways to arrive at God and all faiths are, you know, building towards the same thing. Um, but then on the other hand, there was maybe less the Hindu and more the Indian, uh, side, which was, which was more politically rooted, right? Which did have some divisive, rhetoric, you know, uh, around the Muslim community, around uh, most often, but even sometimes around the Christian community. And and I think about that and I'm like, yeah, you know, why Why was it like that, right? Why? why, why well, where did that come from? And I've always just been curious about what it would look like uh, for everyone to, to come together, right? And recognize the commonality, appreciate the differences. And I think there's, you know, a, a sort of this tension within me, right? There's the like, recognition of the complexity of our reality and then there's the idealism right of like why can't we all just get along <laughs> you know and i think i'm excited just to 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 explore that and to see what it looks like to to hold both of those things together right the complexity the differences but also the spirit of uh being in community so uh very excited just to to dive into all of that but gabe i'm curious what all of that or, or just the theme more generally uh, evokes for you? You're, uh, you're muted, Gabe, by the way. Thanks, maybe we can just edit that out a little later. Um, thanks for that, sharing that, Rahul. I resonate with that personally. And yeah, you know, I, I think on our show, we talk about weaving a lot woven wings you know we talk and we talk about that on different layers and themes uh whether it's ecological um or uh communal and social and here we're talking about it in the context of religion and i think that religion you know i, I grew up in in berkeley california and i would say I've, I've gone on probably a deeper dive around religion than most people that i know uh and there's a lot of reasons for that but i think in that liberal context, religion is often seen as the problem or something that's kind of holding us back. It's something that engenders more um, more divisive rhetoric, as you said, more um, kind of more of a perspective that is inflexible and and leads to conflict. And I think uh, what my own personal journey has been is that religion, you know, in as the root of the word, the Latin root suggests it's also what connects us and ties us back 
to something very ancient and deep. And that's also why it's not so simple to just, you know, evolve our way out of uh, our connection to religion. Um, we can't just rewrite the um, rewrite the history of what we've all gone through as as a humanity and species. Even as that ability to be creative and interpretive uh, is is very important, and I think we see that also when it comes to religion. And so, to me, uh, we can't really be thinking about imagining a healthier world without really dealing in depth with this experience of religion and the multiple multifaceted nature of religion in our world. Um, religion is often at the heart of our conflicts. Um, it's often, you know, dogmatism and, uh, and intensity in that way, one sidedness in that way that leads people to feel justified in harming one another. And I think we see that happening. Uh, you mentioned in India, that's happening in India today. We see that happening in Israel and Palestine. We see that happening all over the world. Um, and so I think it's something that's so important and, and core to who we are. And at the same time, it's something that drives our conflicts. And so we have to spend time really to uh, fall in love with it, you know, and, and work it, you know, in the way that that only love can do. And so, um, yeah, I think that's why it's one reason that it's important. And, um, and the other thing I'll say, and, and this we're going to get into as I introduce Sharik here in one moment, is that we often think about religion as these really large and overarching abstract, you know, institutions or forces. And one thing I really appreciate about Sharik's work is how local he has made it and the Minaret Foundation has made it, how particular um, and specific those relationships become that changes everything. And so on that note, I want to uh, bring in our guest, Sharik Abdul Ghani. And Sharik is the executive director of the Minaret Foundation, an organization focused on bringing faith communities together through multi-faith and civic engagement. Apart from dialogue, dodgeball, and barbecues, Minaret Foundation works with faith communities to change the world through advocacy and food insecurity, child welfare, and religious freedom. Sharik was appointed as the chairman of the city of Houston's Food Insecurity Board and serves as a director in his local municipal utility district, being the first Muslim elected to a position in Fort Bend County. He completed his, elected, uh, his graduate studies in Homeland Security from the Bush School at Texas A&M, and he is currently pursuing his master's in negotiation and conflict resolution with a focus on peace building from Columbia University. And so, Shari, uh, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for joining us. And uh, before I ask you any sort of serious question, how are you doing today? What's up? Today's been a really good day. Um, we got to meet, um, we got to, I got to meet some really interesting change makers. You know, part of the work that I do, you know, bringing faith communities together means I get to meet people in other faith communities. I get to meet people who operate or have tangential services. So met met um, met a, a vice president of an organization that operates in um, in, a, in in a tough part of our city um, that that isn't doing so well socioeconomically, and they provide uh, mental health services to to children. And then earlier before that, I got to meet someone who works within the scope of food insecurity um, with the Episcopalian Church, and their entire focus is working on maternal. Uh, mater maternal health from a food systems perspective. So just hearing stories of the work that they're doing, of the types of situations they've encountered, but but solutions, right? Both of these guys that I that I got to hang out with, I was blessed to hang out with today, are working on solutions to counter the issues that they're dealing with. So we're just spitballing ideas on how we can work together, where there's some overlap, and we found some we found some pretty common threads. But more than anything, it's just really nice hanging out with change makers, right? Hanging out with people who are just making a difference. We're not talking about the Astros or, I don't know, the NFL. I think that's in season right now. Is football in season? <laughs> We're not talking about stuff like that. We're not even talking about traffic or how terrible the weather in Houston is consistently. We're finally seeing fall here, by the way. It's only 95 degrees, but that means fall is here. <laughs> um, we're talking about like people's lives. It's just a lot of fun. We just, it's, today was just a really good day, and the coffee was well, awesome. That that's great, Sharik. And and um, you know what? 
struck me the first time we chatted is just your vivaciousness, you know, and your excitement and uh, energy around this idea of chain making, uh, change making, and and um, really would love to just start with some of the basics, right? Like, what is the Minaret Foundation? Um, what is its mission, and how did you? started or what was your inspiration? Like, how did it get started? I'd love to just hear a little bit about that story and, and uh, your primary focus areas. I, um, you know, I, I was on a trip to the former Yugoslavia with a multi-faith group. Um, there's a Lutheran pastor who had, who found something in me, which was amazing, very blessed by it. Uh, his name's uh, Reverend Steve Quill of the ELCA, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America. And he was putting together a group uh, through his organization called Truth, uh, very long acronym: Travels Reveal Understanding, Trust, and Hope. Truth, right? It took me a while <laughs> to figure that out. I mean, it took me a while to, to, to be able to remember that acronym. But the idea was that you travel together as a multi faith group. I mean, the objective is nice uh, of understanding the role faith played in the reconciliation process post Yugoslavian War. But what really ended up happening is that the faith communities I went, the leaders I went, we really became best buds. We really got to understand and know one another. And a lot of great, a lot of, a lot of goodness came out of that. You know, before that trip, I was just on an interfaith speaking circuit. I was going to synagogues. I was going to churches. I was going to universities and just organizations like, like exchange clubs, uh, Masonic lodges, places like that, talking about who we are as American Muslims. And the reason I was doing that, by the way, I wasn't a chaplain, didn't have a degree in Islamic studies. I studied Islam for a number of years with Muslim scholars um, very consistently. So I had, a, I had a pretty decent understanding of the religion, but my background was in public relations. So my goal was to present an American version of Islam, American Islam, the identity of the second generation of American Muslims in this country. And I did that. I caught the attention of this, uh, of this pastor took me overseas. I was the only Muslim on the trip, filled with Lutherans, one Episcopalian, one rabbi, and me as the Muslim, as a token Muslim. And uh, we had a great time. We went to Skopje, Macedonia. We went to Croatia, different cities in Croatia. We met with uh, former heads of state. We met with their version of city council, their faith leaders, change makers. But we also met with war criminals. And there was one individual that we met with in Skopje, Macedonia, right at the gate. I mean, it was, it was a a long day of meetings, right? Um, you know, Gabe and I just recently came back from Colombia and it was just sometimes it was like four or five meetings in a day. Um, this was about 12 to 15 meetings in a day. From the morning you wake up to the time you go to sleep, it's nothing but it was like mass productivity. We're just, we're just on a schedule. And there was an individual that, that came in and he walked into the room. He looked like the typical villain from a Rocky movie, right? Or just, you know, those Cold War 80s, 80s action movies where you've got that Slavic villain, you know, from the Soviet Union. He's got this <laughs> jawline that's that's ridiculous. I could cut wood. He's got this buzz cut, the flat top going, and he's got that thick accent that's so stereotypical. It's comical, okay? And he walks in and he sits down, and this is a guy you would never want to be stuck in an alleyway with. And he tells us his story. Right, he's a born again Christian. He tells us his story, and he says when he was growing up in Macedonia. Now the thing about Macedonians, Macedonians ethnically are Christian, right? But the area of Macedonia at that time, at that time it was in Macedonia, it was Yugoslavia. But at that time, in that area of Yugoslavia, if you're Macedonian, you're a Christian. If you're Albanian, you are Muslim. So he grew up across the street, literally across the street from Albanian Muslims. And the Albanians spoke their own language. They ate their own type of food. They had different types of food, right? They went to their own faith centers. They had their own schools. They had their own football leagues. They had their own community centers. They had their own swimming pools. They were segregated entirely from one another, though they lived across the street. And the only time they would interact with one another is when the football would go across the street into their yard. Right? And they had to retrieve their football or go into the backyard and they had to retrieve the football. That's the only time they had interaction because the Macedonians lived in an entirely separate way. And so when they were growing up, you know, maybe, maybe some of your listeners can, can relate to this. But when you grow up apart from a community and sometimes your parents are feeding you nonsense and all you know about that other community is what your parents or what your school teachers have told you. 
Well, they always thought Muslims were this and that. They, they had no idea because they never they never communicated. They never talked to one another. In fact, the Albanians had a specific understanding of who the Macedonian Christians were. So they grew up across the street from one another, otherizing one another, growing up not in fear but in suspicion that these people mm. are really different. They're not like us. They're so different from us. They're just a whole different group of people. And so when Tito's government was falling apart, his health, just everything in Yugoslavia was just going downhill at that time, the calls for nationalism really came about, right? Separation, secession from the state. And this isn't just the Macedonians are talking about it. The Albanians are talking about it. The Bosnians are talking about it. The Serbs are talking about it. Uh, the Croats are talking about it. The Soviet, everyone's talking. Nationalism is in the air. It's the wave of the moment. Because everything was held together by this strong-fisted, iron-handed Tito, communist regime. Everything's falling apart. And so when things are really starting to fall apart, people started talking about what does a Macedonia look like. And the Macedonians got really worried that the Albanians are thinking the same thing and they're going to take over our neighborhood. The Macedonians wanted their area. So now we're talking about split in geography. India, Pakistan, where is the line drawn, right? You had that mass, the largest mass exodus in human history that occurred between India and Pakistan. So it's, they're thinking the same thing. Where are the lines being drawn? And so this, this Slav said, when we started talking about our borders, it was easy for me to have suspicion of you. And he looked at me. I was the only Muslim in the room. And when the, when the media started to cast blame, it was easy for me to blame you. And when the call for war broke out, it was easy for me to kill your people like dogs. And he was a sniper. He was paramilitary. And again, you know what paramilitary is, right? We, we, we learn all about that in Colombia. This is not, they don't play by the rules. These are not people who play by the rules at all. There's no code or honor or conduct amongst them. And he was a war criminal. That moment when he looked at me with the steely, stone cold eyes and he, and he said, it was easy for me to kill your people like dogs. That's when my life changed. I was doing interfaith work on the side. It wasn't something I really took seriously. But when he said that, I understood that that was my life's calling. You see, in, in the U.S. at that time, this is 2010. This is during Obama's time, height of the war on terror. Places are being bombed all over northern Pakistan. The war in Afghanistan is being ramped up. Muslims are still being blamed for an event that took place nine years ago, even though it had nothing to do with us. Just people claiming to be us bombed the towers. And, and then everything, every, all the nastiness that happened between that time. See, in Houston... I lived and I still live in a city that is a microcosm of what the United States will look like by 2050. We are the most diverse city per capita. Forget New York, Chicago, LA, San Francisco. All that is nothing. We leave all of those cities in our dust. We are the most <laughs> by capita diversity in the entire nation. And we will be what, you, what America looks like by 2050. And I live in Fort Bend County, which is the most diverse county per capita in the nation. So there's studies abound of what Houston's doing, what Houston needs to look like, how he can become a model city, a representation for what America needs to be through policy. So we love talking about diversity. Oh, we've got Nigerian restaurants, Pakistani restaurants, Indian restaurants, Russian, German restaurants, et cetera, et cetera. But none of that means diddly squat. Because diversity is just a sociogeographic term. It doesn't mean I'm eating in the Nigerian restaurants and they're eating Pakistani restaurants or I'm eating in Indian and they're eating at Russian restaurants. We're still living in our pockets. Not ghetto-wise, because this is in New York. This is Houston. We're all doing pretty damn well over here. But we're still living in our own pockets. We're not interacting with one another. And this is during Obama's time where white nationalism is coming up. People are hating on the president for being black and all this and that. And... We thought it was really bad, right, during Barack Obama's time. We thought our, our, our nation is sort of falling apart. And that was a perspective that I was looking at it from. It's like, we just need, like, one thing to happen. It will really show the cracks in our communities. So my goal when I came back was to identify programming, was to identify methods to bring our communities together. Little did we even have any idea that a Trump would be coming down the pipeline and truly reveal the cracks in our communities, not just in Houston and Texas, but throughout our nation, right? Heck, even in, in many respects throughout the world where we stand uh, amongst and, and with one another. 
And so I was sitting at a, uh, I was sitting at a Pakistani restaurant eating a traditional dish called Nahari. And I was uh, with a rabbi, Rabbi Steve Gross, one of my best friends in the world, and um, who became one of my best friends. So I didn't really know a Jew before that trip, by the way. I, I would go to synagogues, but I never befriended anyone, never talked to, never really talked to anyone. And um, I knew Jews growing up when uh, I was in high school, but after that, it was just no contact until I was about like 30. And, uh, and we decided, you know, he told me, he asked me, what do you do during Christmas? I said, we go out for like maybe a Pakistani restaurant, we'll have some family over, maybe we'll watch a movie, play some pool, you know, we, just, we do a bunch of nothing. And then he told me, well, you know, we go to the movies and we eat Chinese food. I, again, I had no contact with the Jewish community. I always thought that was an anti-Semitic trope. I thought I was like, you don't say that, Jews don't do that. That's like, that's anti-Semitic, you don't say that. And so... <laughs> blew my mind that they actually do that. And so I said, well, we, you got a whole bunch of nothing going on. I've got a whole bunch of nothing going on. Let's start the Muslim Jewish Christmas, right? And from then, it's been 13 years now, but we've been growing the program. It's included many more synagogues. One year it's at a mosque. One year it's a synagogue. We've taken down a, a natural history museum before, rented out an IMAX, brought whole communities there to have discussion and dialogue. But that was really the beginning of Minaret Foundation, where our focus is bringing faith communities together to change the world around us. Specifically, in the beginning, it was Muslims, Jews, and Christians. And we did that through the barbecue discussion and the dodgeball, right? It wasn't just the Muslim Jewish Christmas. It was brisket, chili cook-off. Got to have that. This is Texas. Uh, we've got dodgeball. We've got a kickball <laughs> tournament coming up on October 15th. We had our last kickball tournament last year, and the Jewish community wiped our butts because we're all coming out, you know, older college, young professionals, older professionals, they literally showed up in two 12-passenger vans with 15, 16-year-olds. Total cheating. Total cheating. <laughs> uh, and then they just destroyed. They destroyed a group of evangelicals and Muslims. But then, you know, and, and we did that for like the first eight years. The whole focus was building trust, bringing our communities together, building relationships between the imams, the rabbis, and the pastors. And we did this year after year, program after program after program. They would be invited to the mosques. We wouldn't be invited to the churches. We'd come observe Easter Sunday. You know, they'd come observe during Eid, have iftar with us, which is the breaking of the fast. But then we hit a ceiling. There's only so much of the relationship building that you can do. There's only so much kumbaya that you can do without it being, without losing interest amongst the audience, because really we still operate and still target a very specific group of people, people who are open and receptive, right? Who want to engage, who want to do something different. We're still not getting a whole group of people, but even then we're not really deepening the relationships. And a way of deepening relationships, especially in an interfaith setting is you make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for the homeless, because then you get to have the conversations. You get to do Habitat for Humanity and build a home. The idea isn't to build a home. It's not to feed the homeless. That's really not the end objective. That's a nice perk. What the objective is, is as I'm slathering peanut butter, we talk about how allergies affect our lives, or we talk about you know food and talk nonsense about our parents or our teachers or the latest game on Switch. It's the journey along the way. But those are only two to eight hour commitments. And so what we did was we answered that age old question of what's next from our perspective. And that what's next is public policy. Uh, when, you know, when you're going to City Hall, when you go to the Capitol, when you're going to Austin, that van ride two and a half hours to the Capitol and in working in legislation means 18 months of conversations, 18 months of struggle, 18 months of joy and happiness. And then we were able to get five pieces of legislation passed this past session. The first Muslim organization in the state of Texas to do so in 20 years, by the way. But we did it with the faith coalition of Muslims, Jews, Christians, Hindus, Sikhs, right? We all came together to work on public policy that affects children because we, we operate in three areas, child welfare, food insecurity, and religious freedom. And the, the last thing I'll say in a very long-winded fashion that I just realized um, that I've been is that we can discuss our similarities and our differences all day long. But unless we're adding each other on Facebook, unless we're talking about our struggles and our difficulties in life, unless we're inviting each other to our homes to eat and dine, it's still diversity. It's not plurality. So getting these laws passed is nice, but it's not the goal. 
The goal is that van ride on the way to the Capitol, where our congregations come together and hold up signs and lobby in offices, and then we celebrate together, then we dine together. That's really where the relationships start to form. That's where people come together. Epic, Sharik. Uh, thank you so much for sharing all of that. Um, there's about like 20 or 30 different offshoots. I feel like I could take this down, um, but it's just, you know, just getting like the overall picture. I think you you summarize so much in what you shared that is really powerful. One question I have coming up is the role of faith specifically. Um, a lot of what you described, I feel like you could bring different ethnic groups together or um, people in diversity from a, from a range of demographics. And specifically, your organization focuses on faith and um, the role and importance of faith. And kind of, as I said in the introduction, I think that's probably polarizing. I think that draws people of faith to that or certain segment of that population. And then people who are not of faith, so to speak, or maybe spiritual, but not religious, maybe it turns them off or they don't feel part of that group. Um, another component about that is I think when you look out and read the headlines, again, as I noted in the intro in the world today, faith and religion is often the battle cry for violence or for division. And I'm hearing such a different representation in the programming you're talking about where faith is the vehicle for service. And so this is a two part question. First, why focus this, uh, diver this, this deepening work, this community building work around faith specifically? And two, how does that faith orientation, how, how do we change our faith orientation in the world from fighting and talking about how my religion is right and it's fundamentally opposed to what this religion says so therefore i'm at war with that religion to um to service as you said which from what i can see from my vantage point is also very foundational to pretty much any faith tradition that we have on this planet is this notion of service but when you read the headlines, that's not what we are focusing on, right? People are not going out to give each other bread and uh, and shelter. They're going out to to demonize and and yell at and and sometimes kill one another and take their land. And so, how do how does this work make that transformation happen? And why does focusing on faith itself facilitate that? Yeah. America was founded on principles of faith. Um, I am a deeply spiritual person, or I, I, I hope to be a deeply spiritual person. That's the way my parents have raised me. Um, Texas is a deeply spiritual state. Uh, faith, there, the separation of the notion of separation of church and state, it might work well in California, Washington, Oregon, New York, but it doesn't play well here. We start our meetings off with a prayer. And I'm not talking about a Minaret Foundation. I'm talking about county government, city government, state government. You'll always have a pastor, a mom or a rabbi, someone come in and, uh, and, and lead an invocation. And more often than not, we'll actually close out our meetings with an invocation. The word God will be littered around all throughout the spread around all throughout the meeting. You'll have, you'll have faith leaders come in and testify. This is very normal for us. Um, so faith has a huge, huge, it, it, faith is a huge driver of change in Texas. Our faith leadership are involved in politics. And you'll see this all the time as negative mention that a candidate went and spoke at a mega church. For us, we see that as that's awesome. They're reaching the people where they're at. But others see that as Christian nationalism or Muslim nationalism or they shouldn't be doing this or they shouldn't be doing that. But for us, this is just a part of our culture and our fabric. Yeah, I remember talking to the coalition members in, in, in Portland. And uh, I, I remember I was telling them I'm getting ready for a communication that I'm doing at a, at, at, at a commissioner's court, a county commissioner's court. And they just stopped. They're like, what? That's true? That actually happens in Texas? I just go on to just... Just like, ah, oh, this should be a separation of church and sin. I'm just saying it like, oh my God, you guys are living in an entirely different world. You need to be in my world where we're tolerant of one another. We, we don't just claim to be liberal and progressive. We're actually living out our values and saying, hey, we should, we should tolerate one another and we should respect each other's values. But that being said, you know, it would shift over to something else that you said. And I hear this all the time. 
faith becomes a battle cry to hate one another and to rally against one another. I believe that is a false notion, a false framework that has been put on to us. That's not the actual truth. In fact, in almost the same sentence or the same breath, you also mentioned that faith, that service is such a big part of our faith communities. That is accurate. And what I'll say is, is that there's, there's powers that be, whether we see them or not, and I know this is going to sound very conspiracy oriented, but goodness, there are so many people in Washington and in other parts of the country, leaders throughout our nation that would rather see us divided then come together. And so this divisive rhetoric that our politicians will use, that our media will use, no matter how conservative or liberal they are, they'll all use the same language, that we're divided, that this is happening, that's happening. And it's just not true. Because when you look at our programming and you look at the way that we come together, not just in our work, in our interfaith work, you look at the interfaith work that happens throughout the nation. We don't care about this stuff. What we want to know is where are kids going to go to college? Do we have food on the table? Do we have a roof above our heads? How is our health? Are we getting the treatment that we need? You know, what movies are coming out? Who's winning the ball? That's what we really care about. Caring about, oh, you're a Christian. You're not on the right path. You're a Muslim. You're an infidel. You're a Jew. You're... Just no one really gives a, just no one gives a hoot about any of that. What we really care about is how will we benefit? How will we improve our lives? And once we come together to understand that the Mother Mary plays such a big role in our faith, just as much in the Christian faith, that Moses it plays a huge role in how Muslims pray and who they and who Moses is to the Jewish community. When you learn about these differences and similarities, it's just all this other rhetoric about hating one another, not liking one another, all of it can just, oh, that's solvable, right? And that Tylenol to solve that problem or the cancer treatment to solve that problem is very achievable, very attainable, and it's very quick. Yeah, Shark, what strikes me about what you're saying is that I feel like a lot of the dynamic is you have, you know, you do have extremists, right? You know, they're such a minority of any practicing religious group, but they get headlines, right? And they they might be who's influencing the way people are viewing a particular religion. Then you have, as you mentioned, the powers that be that have a vested selfish interest in encouraging that particular way of looking at what the actual dynamics are. You know, and we were talking about India, Pakistan, and it's like the, the media, you know, the, the, the common coverage is, oh, they're always at odds, they're always at odds. And it's like, well, okay, you actually go to some of these communities, you know, where my dad grew up um, is a town called Ajmer. And it's like, it's, you know, it's in India, a lot of Hindus there, but also has this like giant Muslim population. And in some cases it's divided. And in some cases it's actually pluralistic where people actually mix. And it's, you know, all of this is to say, I think there are, you know, a lot of different realities. And what I love about what you're saying is that, hey, actually the base reality is people have bigger fish to fry you know they have other things on their mind and and they're actually united by the common human challenges you know that we all face and that we all think about right and and you know you named quite a few of those and i think that's such a um important reminder right that hey like those are the things that we're actually thinking about collectively you know more than some of these things that we might, might be made to think you know are the actual problems and so as uh, Building towards actually the question that I had for you then is you described a lot of different ways that people are coming together, uh, you know, interfaith uh, through everything from play, which I loved. I love that that's where, where Minaret started, you know, as an entry point to to building connection and building trust. Um, and then that it went into something deeper, right? Actually working on projects together, uh, working on community building together through policy. And, and I'm curious, like, what does it actually like look like for these leaders to come together that that's different maybe from the way that people perceive it? And once the leaders that you work with or just in general that these interfaith groups work with or, or look at, you know, once they come together, how does that reverberate throughout the community? Uh, you know, even the people that are not actively participating in these programs, uh, what does that halo effect look like? So I'll, I'll pause there. It, it, you know, you know it, 
it, it's funny that you bring that up because it's not an immediate impact. There, there's multiple ways that you can go about, well, there's really two ways that you go about interfaith. You go to the bottom approach or the top down approach. So you go from the clergy downwards or you go from the congregants upwards. Um, our approach has been sort of a mix going from the bottom up, top down. But the majority of it has been going from the imams, the rabbis, and the pastors. And what we hope is our relationships trickle down to the congregations. And the way that we do that is by doing pastoral exchanges, right, or clergy exchanges in each of the. So we've got the imam that goes to the church, the, the pastor that goes to the synagogue, the rabbi that comes to the mosque. And we do these sort of trilateral exchanges so the congregants themselves can see that they're talking to one another and they're because it's different you know you know this is a big oil and gas city houston so i mean in oil and gas there's a lot of muslims jews christians we all work together right not we but they all work together they don't really talk about religion right because uh, we discourage m much to my disdain we discourage talking about politics and faith in the workplace i don't think it should be that way those two biggest factors should be discussed or it should be okay to discuss these types of things but we don't discuss these types of things. So while I might sit next to a Jew in a cubicle on my right and a Christian on my left, we don't talk about who we really are because faith is the core essence of so of, of the faithful, right? This is how we live our lives. It's how, how we build our morals and our principles. Um, so when, when we have these types of events, whether it be the barbecues or the kickball tournaments or just these open dialogues, um, it, I, I find that people find it to be refreshing. They always leave with that cliche statement. Oh, we always have more in common than we don't. That's good to know. It's, everyone says that. It's the same thing that everyone across the board says. Like <laughs> um, but it, it, it circles out in that, you know, if we do it once, they might say it once. But if we do it several times and invite the same people over and over again, invite them to new activities, new opportunities, new ways to interact within the same ecosystem, of their community and different faith communities, then it, it becomes more than just words. It becomes a Facebook ad friend. It becomes a, oh, would you like to go out with me? Or, oh, hey, I got, I've got a few spots left on my fantasy football. Would you, would you like to participate? Things like that. And that's really, those are the good metrics. Hard to measure, but those are the metrics that we want to achieve. We want to see us three here right? A Rahul, a Gabe, and a Shark on the same fantasy football team or throwing balls at one another, throwing dodgeballs at one another. Doing it in an unstructured environment outside of a Minaret Foundation program where they're doing it on their own. Um, it takes time and it takes repeated contact. It's not a one-time one one issue because like everything else, we've got so much going on in our lives, right? So we sort of have to babysit the relationship just a little bit. I want to go back to this idea of extremists and dogmatists because, and, and juxtaposing it to what you just said, Shari, of this unstructured, difficult to measure, and maybe that's part of the question here too, interaction and deepening of relationships. That's when we get to that cliche, but such a lovely cliche, right? That we have more in common than we realize that actually those stories, those forces that have profited off our division are not making a home inside each one of us, you know, and are actually, uh, that that is illusory. That's a great ideal. But then, you know, thinking about my own experiences traveling around, it's not, uh, you know, whether it's in Israel or in my synagogue in Maui, uh, it's not the extremists always that are not a bunch of nice, normal people. And then someone in the corner, you go like, oh, that guy's definitely the extremist. Uh, you know, it's, it's actually scattered through everyone's commentary in a host of little statements here and there about like what came to my mind is during this conversation is the distrust I hear in my Jewish community in Maui of the so-called messianic Jews or basically Christians uh, attempting to convert them or something to Christianity and therefore not being open or interested to have interfaith activities with Christian groups, which dominate our island. And these are not uh, extremists in the group. Again, these are like normal people who are thinking in a type of group think that's been culturally normalized, that that is a normal, healthy way of thinking and not a piece of dogma or extremism. How do we root this out? You know, I mean, like, I, I guess my point being that we, we are the extremists. We, we are the ones walking around with this, these narratives, these stories, and 
that's what's so problematic. You know, when I visit with Lakshmi with our family in India, the rhetoric that's going on in India right now around it, Hindus and Muslim, that relationship is continuing to fray and intensify. What do we do to personally connect to to create that change? I guess maybe I ask you personally, how have you noticed that in your own life, Shari? Like those voices inside you, have you noticed those existing? And how has this work kind of confronted you or helped you to make a shift in any way around those or, or feel some of those stories get recycled into something that's more uh, life-giving and more community-oriented. You know, Gabe, there's a there's a theory that we learned at Columbia. It's called contact theory, which essentially it says that when you speak to and you have a meaningful conversation with someone that you've never met, it's easier to humanize them, right? It's easier to understand them. And that plays at the role of the story that really began Minaret Foundation. If the Albanians and the Macedonians had taken the time or were culturally aware of one another and had the presence of mind to build relationships quite literally across the street, maybe we wouldn't have seen the atrocities that we saw, or maybe it would have stayed it um, for a few days or a few months or a few years. There could have been different outcomes. You're right in that it's not the extremists driving the conversation. Sometimes it's the board members that are mosques and our synagogues and our churches that are driving the conversations apart from one another because they have this internal bias this internal fear of the other that they may not even be aware of. I see this all the time in the Muslim community, and I see it all the time in the Jewish community as well. It's they just don't know where they land on Palestine or where they land on the settlements or on Israel or the West Bank or on this issue or that issue. So it's like, I'd rather not talk to them. I just don't want to deal with this. I have too many problems in my life. I don't want to get into a confrontation with someone. But unless we extend our hand, the divide will not just be there, but it will continue to grow because there's forces outside of us that want to see this divide grow. They want to see us not talking to one another. It has to be, it takes a lot of courage and it takes a lot of strength. And we have to overcome a lot just sometimes to give an apple pie to our neighbors, to talk to them about their day, to say, how are you doing? Right. And oftentimes that's a barometer for where our relationships are with people around us in our communities. Do you even know the name of your neighbors? It doesn't have to be their faith. It doesn't have to be the kids' names. But do you know the names of the adults that live next to you? Do you know what their fears are? Do you know when their birthday is? Do you know what their anniversary is? What's going on in their life? Until we start talking to one another, we're not going to be able to bridge the divide. And people in charge of our frames will continue to divide us and dictate who we are. I'll give you a quick example. Right now in the news, Congresswoman Boebert is just all over the news for some of her actions in Colorado. The media is running away and painting her as a representation of the entire Republican Party. It just, she is the figure. And if it's not her, then it's Marjorie Taylor Greene. And on the conservative side, they paint AOC as a representation of the entire Democratic Party. And neither AOC, MJT, or Lauren Boebert represent either party. They don't represent the majority of either party. But the powers that be are dividing us further and further. These headlines are poisoning the well of America. And it takes conversations like the ones that we're having here today and the ones that we can have in our neighborhoods and our communities to sort of de-radicalize our minds, de-radicalize our hearts, and start to bring us together. Yeah, one of the pieces that Gabe highlighted at the beginning uh, that you just highlighted again here, Sharik, is is the focus on the local, right? On on having actual contact, uh, having actual conversation. And I know, you know, we talked about your tagline, right? Um, working within our faith communities to change the world around us. Together, we are strong and c- can create a lasting impact. And that piece, the world around us. You know, I think is, is is a piece you'd highlighted that can be interpreted in a lot of different ways. And I think, um, you know, here, like in San Francisco, the you know, one of the capitals of armchair liberalism, right? It's very easy to just think about the world as this big thing, and and to think about these issues on a uh, on a grand scale, on a state level, national level, international level, versus actually getting in and doing the work locally, you know, and, and connecting with people, Albanian, Macedonian example as, as the inspiration for this, but wondering if you could speak even a little bit more, right. To this, this focus on the, 
hyper local, right? That you focus on on Houston, right? And and maybe up to the state legislature versus DC or versus Jerusalem or or Mecca, right? It's like, oh, it's very focused on on on, on the local and people having that contact. Um, how did you arrive at that, right? And and what are some of the lessons that we can take? And and for people that are feeling like like you said, everyone's got a lot going on in their lives. You know, if you're feeling like up to the brim, like how do we how do we bring that into our lives? You know, how, how do we actually act on this idea of connecting with our neighbors? You know, as simple as it is, like what what does it look like to actually get there? Well, you know, our, our geographical focus is bound by, you know, our funding streams, but also where the most impact is. And so we started off in Houston, but now we we work, we have committees and we work on policy throughout the state, primarily Houston, Dallas, and Austin. That being said, Texas is considered the bellwether state. Wherever we pass legislation, 22 other states follow. So our five pieces of legislation are now being looked at by multiple other states. Federal government is just, it's just too hard. It takes years and years and years and years to get anything done. And they get gridlocked over little, you know, gossip girl type, you know, Biden impeachment, right? nothing's going to get done now. Everything's going to get tied up. And our faith communities don't want to get involved in nonsense. They want to get, they want to roll up their sleeves and work in a practical fashion and they want to get something done. And so when you work in the Texas legislature, legislature here in, here in Austin, or you work in city of Dallas or city of Houston or Austin, we have a higher success rate and we can get things done in a more rapid, rapid pace. So focusing on the Texas community, Another another benefit of working in just Texas is that it allows other southern states to see how it can be done. And it allows northern states, it, it's strange that I'm talking about north and south, but it allows northern states to see the positive impact that faith can play in bringing people together, right? Oftentimes, it's just the breaking of bread, but that's a very religious concept. It could be the building of a house, but Habitat for Humanity can be a Christian organization as well. It, it's 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 bringing people together and showing this as a model for community relations and social cohesion. If we can get it done in Texas, we can get it done anywhere. So Sharik, what can people do? I think I think I understand a little bit more the, the answer in the local Houston community, especially connected with your work or throughout the state of Texas. Texas. Get connected to Sharik, get, get connected to the Minaret Foundation, to your local uh, faith community. Uh, see if that faith community can participate in some programming that you're doing, get involved. I know this is not your focus, but as we kind of try to universalize this for anyone tuning in with this, wherever they are in the world, if they want to take this seed and carry this conversation forward, they want to execute this mission in the world, how do they get started? What can they do to actually make this not just a nice idea that they heard on a podcast, but to actually start to make some sort of change in their immediate direct world, in their specific community? What would you tell them about how they can get started? At my local grocery store at the HEV, they sell apple, cherry, and blueberry pies for $4.99 sometimes. $4.99, that's it, five bucks. Buying one, two, ideally five pies and going to their neighbors and distributing to their neighbors, that's it. That's how you hyper-localize the work that we're doing, is you just go to your neighbors and you give them a warm pie. You don't have to tell them you bought it at the grocery store. If you want to, you can. You just take the pie, you give it to your neighbors, and you say, hey, listen, I've got a pie. How are you doing, by the way? That's it. That's all. You know, Out of the five neighbors, one or two will reciprocate, and you've built a relationship. right? And then you continue on, and then you just add it to your Google Calendar every month. Brownies, pie, leftover food that you have, mint lemonade, something once a month, once a quarter, but you make it a consistent habit that at least once to twice a year, I will go out and greet my neighbors. You don't have to learn everything about them. You don't have to host a party for them. You just need to meet them and have a, have a conversation with them. Building relationships with the people around you, especially those who live around you, is essential and easy way because it, I tell you in all of our faith traditions, caring for your neighbor, loving your neighbor is a core component of worship. Sharag, your your recommendation here. I mean, one, it's just like striking in its simplicity. And I was literally, as you were talking about, it, just picturing walking over like my neighbors are like fifteen feet away. <laughs> you know, it's like it's like oh yeah. 
that sounds really like very, very doable. And, and then I was remembering, you know, we did an episode uh, called People and Plants. Um, it was with uh, someone named Ralph, who's an ethnobotanist, ethnobiologist, um, who actually, you know, he, he made this point, which I think applies to plants, but also more generally, right? Which is this idea that uh, you you protect what you know or you protect what you love, right? And and to love somebody, you have to first start by knowing, you know, knowing a little bit about them, a little bit about who they are, what they care about. And again, just, just kind of thinking about that concept and how easily um, one can get started. You know, one can get started on just taking one step, right? And And it doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be something you commit your entire life to or your life's work to, but uh, just just one gesture, you know, and, and, and I could feel the potency in it just as you were talking about it. And what it got me I'm just curious about, you know, more on a personal level for you is what are what are some of the, you know, insights that you've gained, you know, now many, many years into this work? And like, what has it taught you about the world? What are some of the principles you know, that maybe brought you to this work, but that have that have become strengthened for you or some of the values um, that have really come to life for you by taking this path, you know, and committing your life to this kind of work? The, the biggest component of social cohesion is trust. And that takes years to develop. And it takes deliberate actions of trying to build a relationship. You can't just be a one-off. You know, I hung out with him, had coffee with him last year. Yeah, I took him out for lunch. It can't be that. You have to get to a point where you trust one another, where you can be there for one another. That's where the foundation of relationships comes from. But that's also how we build it to the next generation. Because it's not just about us. We have to, you know, it's a succession planning as well. How can we leave America in a way that's beneficial for our children or our grandchildren? And it's by setting them up, laying them up with great relationships that they can then leverage to create even greater relationships and for changes all in the communities around us. And how about just like one layer deeper on that, Shari? I'm curious for you if you personalize that, you know, whether it's trust, that deliberate action, how is this, can you give us an example specific through your own experience around how this has kind of changed you and deepened you in your own, in your own journey, you know, through life is just a, not necessarily as the director of Minaret, as this change leader in the world, but just as a human individual, where has this led you personally, as you've kind of gone along this along this path? Okay, that's a heavy question. That's a really heavy question. Man, I want to be Johnny on the spot with an answer for that one. You don't have to be Johnny on the spot. <laughs> yeah, whatever's real. But just in abstract terms, I mean, it, it leaves me with a sense of curiosity for other people. Um, just not judging a book by its cover, getting to know someone, just being in continuous awe of how little I actually know about the people around me. I, I don't know how to answer that question. It's, it's just continuous curiosity. I think that's the, you, you know, I guess when you're younger, oh, damn, I, I, am I in a position of life where I'm saying that? But you always think you know everything and you know what you know and you've got it down. I feel like I don't know anything anymore. Um, I'm just still trying to grasp who people are and what relationships and trust looks like and where we need to be in the future. I just feel like I don't know anything anymore. I'm just continuously curious. That's that's where it's resulted for me. But yeah, no, I'm sorry. I, I don't know how to answer that question. Damn, that was a good well, one. Well, I, I think you just did, right, in a way. And, and I think the humility um, that you both spoke to, but I think more generally that you embody uh, is so central, right, to not just cultivating or creating the, the bedrock in which that curiosity can thrive. But I think that... Um, that your entire story and, and work can thrive, you know, and I think uh, I can say for myself, just hearing that and experiencing that with this time with you, uh, you know, has been really inspiring, right? Because I think uh, very often uh, what I find even for myself, right, to, to what you said, Gabe, th there are these like stories and, and narratives, right? And even if I'm not actively thinking about them, things that have been around, right, they might feel uh, like knowledge, right? Or they might feel like they're informing uh, the way I go about 
doing something uh, or approaching something. And, and I think what that does is it can close off that curiosity, you know, and I think having um, that humility and just recognizing, hey, actually, there's not, you know, I don't know a lot, you know, and I can always learn and I can always ask, I can always inquire and I can always bring that spirit to any interaction, right? And then, you know, just in general and then and then more specifically to what we're talking about, like deliberately bring that intention, that curiosity to interactions I wouldn't normally have, right? Because it's, it's coming from that desire to connect, uh, to build uh, trust, to, to learn. Um, I think that's, yeah, it's just a really powerful notion. And uh, I'm not even building towards a question, but just, <laughs> just, just reflecting on, on what you just shared there, Sharik. Oh, thanks. Oh, I appreciate that. Um, hey, this is a lifelong journey building trust and relationships. This isn't, it's, it, it's hard for people to work in this space and you guys know what I'm talking about. There's no punch in a clock here. This is, this is work that you either believe in or you don't. And if you believe in it, then there's a sense of urgency that you have to do something. Not that you just have to do something because you just continuously do something. So even when you're on holiday, you're thinking about it, you're sourcing ideas and you're just trying to make your community better. And it doesn't have to be left to people like us three. It's everyone that has a stake in it because everyone should have a voice in their communities and have a voice on what the future of their communities look like, looks like. And in a truly democratic environment, like here in the United States, it's, we, all have, we all have a voice and all have an ability to speak up and say something. But the hardest part is taking that step forward to make something happen. And sometimes we're bounded by our, our means, we're bounded by our knowledge and our abilities, but those are false constructs. As long as we have a breath in our body and a beating heart, if we want to see a change in the world, all we have to do is take one step forward. You know, there, there's, a, there's a hadith, there's a saying of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, says, if you take one step towards God, he will run towards you. And we just have to look into our own lives, whether we're Muslim or not. The moment we set our mind to something and we do one little action, it's like things just start coming, right? It, my son took off on the skateboard ramp the other day. And the hardest part was, was to push off. But the moment he pushed off, that was it. He was going down the ramp. He's going up the other ramp and he fell. But he got back up and he did it again. And it all started with just a one little push off. That was the easiest part of the equation. The hardest part was staying on. Well, on that note, um, you know, usually we ask if there's anything you want to leave our listeners with, but I think that was beautiful as a key takeaway or a last takeaway. I guess, is there anything else, Sharik, you want to, yeah, just, just share with us or just leave as we kind of wrap up for here today? Make a commitment to yourselves that this week you're going to share an apple pie or a potted plant or a tray of brownies or a cookie with your neighbor and just ask them how they're doing. That's it. Just make a commitment to yourself and dedicate that week to just doing one thing for one neighbor and make it a consistent habit, at least quarterly. You know, I'm, I'm touched by uh, your discussion of uh, red states and blue states and separation of church and state. I'm curious if uh, you would be willing to close us out with some sort of convocation or prayer. Yeah, this is the second time in this podcast you've put me on the spot. I'll mention a, I'll mention a brief prayer. I'll ask you all to, to, to share your hearts with me and pray. And God, we, we, we pray for our nation. We pray for the success of our nations, for the success of our communities and the success of our families. We pray that you will allow us to leave our nation in the hands of our children and our grandchildren to use this, to use our foundations and use the skills and the resources we've provided for them to continue making America the greatest nation on this planet. Amen. 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 So on that note, yeah. Thank you, Sharik. Uh, Rahul, you have anything you want to add here? No, just, uh, yeah, I think that, that felt like a great place to end. So I really... Appreciate Sharik everything that you've shared with us today, uh, not just what you said, but but your energy, your perspective, your humility, um, and uh, yeah, just grateful, grateful to have had this time. Thank you, folks.
Very much appreciated. And if anyone ever wants to get a hold of me from your audience, it's just minaretfoundation.com. My contact information is everywhere. Yeah, and we'll we'll have all of that in the episode description as well. So for those tuning in, uh, thank you as always for joining us. And uh, if you enjoyed this conversation, uh, please consider sharing it with a friend, You know, leaving us a review wherever you listen to podcasts uh, or joining our newsletter to follow along our journey. And uh, thank you as always for lending us your support. And uh, as a reminder, you know, just want to emphasize Sharik's challenge uh, or, or invitation or encouragement for all of us uh, to just go out and uh, do one act, one act of kindness, one act of, uh, you know, seeking connection with one of our neighbors and uh, seeing what comes from there. So uh, if you do have a story that comes out of that, uh, please drop us a line. Let us know how it goes. And uh, until next time, thank you all again.